welcome back everyone uh, this is uh, a spring webinar series by nasa rset program on satellite observation for predicting detecting and analyzing fire activity we have already gone through uh, pre-fire conditions uh, including climatology hydrology and vegetation which means we have learned about what is burning and uh, and how the climate and hydrological and vegetation is affecting those burning areas in different parts of the world and what data and uh, tools uh, available from the nasa uh, to actually assess those pre-fire condition and maybe have assessment of risk assessment of fire in different parts of the world so that that is what we covered in session one and session two uh, today we are going to start what is happening uh, during the fire so we have two sessions lined up for that session three today where we will introduce the active fire detection and once the fire actually emits this smoke particles in the atmosphere how to track them how to detect them and how to monitor uh, using various satellite data so i will talk about that and uh, my colleague uh, in the next session will talk more on how we take those information and put in the model for forecasting and so on in session uh, five and six uh, post fire condition will be discussed. So, like I said, today's session will uh, uh, discuss uh, the active fire and smoke product. Uh, my name is Pawan Gupta. Uh, you can see here in the picture, uh, I'm a senior scientist here at USRA at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And my colleague, Dr. Melanie Follett Cook, uh, and Dr. Anna Prados, they are at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, and uh, they both will be uh, talking in session four, and Anna will actually do the same session three and four in a Spanish, Spanish language uh, in the afternoon hours. So before we start, I just want to brief again, uh, show the slide. Uh, throughout this webinar series, uh, we are focusing uh, on three main case studies, three main fire events, one in the Western US uh, during August, September of 2020. Uh, another one was agriculture fires in Sub-Saharan Africa region, again, during the same period in last year. And then we are also discussing some of the fire which happens uh, in Southern Mexico uh, in year 2019 during the dry summer time. So we will keep uh, most of our analysis around the three case studies, but we will also show examples of other uh, parts of the world uh, as it comes uh, in different parts of the presentation. So let's uh, start today's presentation. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about fire, smoke, and aerosol monitoring from space. Uh, the learning objective for this specific talk are uh, to understand the different ways in fire where fire can be detected using various satellite observations. Uh, identify and download satellite detected fire data sets from various NASA and man NASA uh, data centers. And then understand av available smoke and aerosol data sets, uh, again derived from the satellite and how to use them uh, for monitoring air quality during a, a specific fire event. So first, uh, I'm going to start with the fire and smoke detection. So this is more on a visible site. So when we say fire, um, what comes to your mind? And to, to actually get a visual perspective of that, I just use the word fires in Google search image. And when I see the first uh, several image comes up, uh, they shows the fire images taken by people on the ground, by aircraft, and even satellite images uh, such as uh, uh, this one and this one and this one comes up very quickly and the fires appears very differently from different uh, depending on where and how the pictures is taken and what is burning on the ground. So the idea here is that satellites are an integral part of monitoring fires all around the world uh, for quite some time and that's what we are going to talk. So I'm going to just keep briefly give you a few more examples of these searches uh, on uh, on internet. So when I type the forest fires, I see these pictures mostly taken by people on the ground, big 
uh, light you can see a lot of uh, larger areas are burning big trees are burning these are typically uh, wildfires or forest fires and again the satellite data comes up uh, in this image search in first 10 20 images so which again reiterate that the satellite is an integral part of uh, monitoring these events similarly when you type the agriculture fires again you can see a very complete different pictures from this these fires are small they are burning on fields for a smaller time window they emit the smoke which is kind of creates a hazy sky around those and again satellite uh, images uh, shows up wherever there are agriculture fires as a detection as a red spot in those uh, images uh, there is another kind of burning called best burning or the garbage burning and it happens in many parts of the world and these are typically very isolated uh, fires small in size and here you can see the most of these images are taken by people on the ground so there is a very limited capability from the satellite actually to detect these fires there are some commercial satellite which are having very high resolution or some of the land mapping satellite like landsat which can actually detect some of these fires but their frequency is very limited so we in this throughout the series we are not going to actually talk a lot about these uh, west burning fires okay so now we have seen these pictures which gives us a visual uh, perspective of what fire looks like to a human eye now when it comes to the automated detection from the satellite uh, we rely on three different pieces of information uh, one is the smoke definitely if there is a fire there is a smoke and these smoke uh, can be detected by the satellite uh, using different uh, uh, methods and typically they appears grayish in colors again depending on what kind of fuel is burning those colors can change and we'll see some examples so the smoke is one way in which we can detect uh, if there is fires another one is temperature anomaly it means you saw in the previous pictures whenever there are fires uh, uh, the temperature of the landscape and the surrounding increases and that if we can detect that uh, change in temperature in those pixels in those land areas then we can actually identify some of those uh, fires there those change in temperature can happen because of the other regions also and we'll discuss those as we go along and how to identify those things and uh, remove from the fire detection data uh, that we'll discuss later and then the third one is the light so uh, whenever there are fire there is also light emits uh, in most cases unless it is a smolding type of fires and that light we have satellite capabilities now where actually we can picture uh, earth on a regular interval to detect these lights and typically these are done uh, and during night time daytime is not uh, suitable for those kind of pictures because of because of the uh, sunlight so during the night time uh, we take these pictures of uh, night lights and sometime in areas where we don't expect um, uh, um, artificial light uh, the fire lights can actually come up and if we can uh, we can detect those that's another source of information to uh, identify fires in satellite imageries during the night time so let's look up uh, different satellites and different system sensors which are out there uh, in various earth orbits and which are providing information on both smoke and fire detection so what you see here is uh, several of these satellites have been already introduced in session one and two uh, to do other task so i will not get into the details but just briefly want to mention there are two uh, types of uh, satellite which we typically use one is called leo low earth orbiting satellites and the examples include modis two of the modis one makes measurement in morning modis terra and modis aqua in the afternoon and the good thing about the modis is it has been around for almost 20 years so we have a 20 years of the data records from that but it's 20 years and the satellite is becoming old so it's going to uh, it's going to phase out pretty soon so the new generation to continue that observation the new generation of satellites uh, or sensors called veers 
uh, is available since 2012. There are currently two wears which are award. Uh, both of them make measurement in the afternoon and they provide high quality uh, fire detection information um, uh, twice a day, one in during daytime, one during nighttime. And then you have a another set of satellites like Landsat, Sentinel, which are very high resolution uh, in, in their spatial resolution, but their frequency of repeat uh, observations are limited. So a combination of number of different satellites uh, uh, really available to actually detect this measurement. The, the limitation of LEO is that they only provide one measurement during daytime and one measurement during nighttime. Uh, but the advantage is that they have a global coverage. The other type of uh, satellites called geo or geostationary satellites. Uh, again, there are a number of examples here. Uh, the geostationary typically makes measurement uh, over certain region and they are deployed by individual countries to primarily uh, manage or observe the weather condition and disaster conditions in that particular country or region. Uh, the advantage of geostationary is that they provide very frequent measurement from minutes to hour uh, temporal resolution, uh, but they are typically lower in a spatial resolution compared to LEO and only have a regional coverage as compared to global coverage. So one of the sensor which is uh, we are going to use in our presentation from the geo is called ABI advanced baseline imager. It is very similar to MODIS or VIRS in many sense and there are differences uh, and we will discuss them as we go along. Now one of the uh, piece of information or imagery which we often use from the satellite is called true color imageries and this is very very useful in manually or visually detecting visible smoke and uh, this true color image is a nothing but called it is also called rgb uh, because it is a combination of these three uh, spectral band where satellite is making measurement red green and blue in case of modis these are the three wavelength 0.66 micron 0.55 micron and 0.47 micron in case of the veers uh, the bands are similar uh, um, but there may be a little bit different in the specific wavelength but the advantage of this visible uh, rgb image or true color image is that it shows the features in this image in the same way as we will look out uh, through our human eyes. So cloud will look white, water will look darker in colors, um, or the smoke particle will look either gray or brownish uh, depending on their color. So the, these, these true color images uh, can be a critical source of information for manually seeing where things are happening all around the globe and where the smoke is traveling. Here are some examples of uh, those three case studies, as I mentioned earlier, uh, how the visual smoke looks in true color image. Again, these are taken from the VIRS instrument. Uh, and we will go through this tool called Worldview in a little bit and see how you can actually access these images. So the first one is uh, September 11, 2020, taken over Western US showing thick plume of smoke actually coming out from these different fires. And if you look carefully, you can see that uh, there are different source of uh, fires which are actually putting out a smoke. And the, the way the wind direction is that the most of this smoke is transporting over ocean. And, um, but the, if, you, I, if you see cl clearly that the smoke is very grayish, very thick, and this is uh, mainly from the forest fire or the wildfires. In the middle, you have August 19, 2020 case over Zambia in uh, southern central Africa, where you can see a gray uh, layer of haze. Uh, and this is very different than what you see in Western US. These are the agriculture fires or open burning happens in that part of the world almost every year during the season. And this uh, happens to actually clear the land to prepare for the ne next crop. 
And these are typically small fields uh, burning uh, for a very short period of time. So they generate uh, uh, a smoke, but the smoke amount is less and they appear as more transparent as compared to the wildfire smoke. And then the last you have uh, similar uh, wild combination of wildfires and open burning happening in Mexico City, Mexico, uh, southern Mexico around May 10 on 2019. Uh, you can again see there are several smoke layer or hazy sky along the coast side and on north of the Mexico City where the fires are burning. So these are just some examples of a uh, different views of smoke in true color imageries. Now let's talk about this uh, data sets or the what we call Actifier product. So typically in satellite community, all the data sets are called product, but basically they are data sets. Uh, so there are three uh, which are listed here. One is from MODIS. Again, there are two MODIS. Uh, Mardo 4 is um, Model 4A1 and MYD401, uh, uh, these are from Modis Terra and Equa. This is from the Veers, and then you have AVI, FDC uh, from Veers. These products uh, are available in near real time, means within two, three hours of satellite overpass time, and they're also available for, uh, uh, for historical data past years or past 10 years. So for example, MODIS is available for past 20 years. VIRS from SUMI NPP is available for last nine years. Uh, similarly, AVI is available for last two, three years. So once you put all this data on a map, you will see a map like this. And this is just a, a one month map of fire detection by the VIRS. And if you look at this map, it looks like the most of the world is on fire. And this is a little bit um, misleading in the sense it is not really like that. It's uh, the way the fire information is displayed on the map, uh, it appears that way. But we, when we go to the world view, I'll show you zoom in in specific areas, and then you will see that it's not that the entire area is burning, but there are so many small or large fires happening. And when you put those information on the map, it appears like um, the world is on fire. Okay, so let's look a little bit more into uh, details of what these uh, fire data sets are and how different sensors uh, can be used to assess different aspect of those fires. So fire detection are basically, uh, these are, um, as we learned earlier, and uh, from satellite images, the satellite images are consist of pixels. So pixel is the smallest unit in a satellite imagery and it is uh, defined as the uh, certain piece of land area or ocean area on the surface of Earth. So in case of MODIS, it is one by one square kilometer. In case of VIRS, uh, there are two different resolution for VIRS, but the most often we use 375 meter by 375 meter square meter. So VIRS is higher resolution as compared to Modis and the pixel size in ABI is two by two square kilometer. And these uh, resolutions are defined for the nadir position. Um, and this can change as we go to the edge of the uh, satellite swath. Now, these fire data not only contain the active fires, but they can also detect the volcanic signatures. So that is another type of fire identify in the data sets. Now, as you can see here that the MODIS resolution is coarser or lower compared to the VIRS. So because of this higher spatial resolution of VIRS, often VIRS detects three to four times more fire than MODIS globally. And you can just see an example here uh, on the right side. This is again from the Zambia and the Central uh, Southern Africa. Uh, on August 12, 2020, MODIS Aqua image, which is make measurement around 1.30 in the afternoon, and within 15 minutes of MODIS Aqua, VIRS on SUMI and PP satellite actually visit the same place, and they detect the fire. So now if you compare the top image with the bottom, you see that the VIRS is detecting a lot more fires. Again, because of its higher spatial resolution, it is able to detect some of the smaller fires, 
which are missed by MODIS because of the coarser resolution. And also, uh, MODIS uh, may account a uh, uh, few smaller pixels within one square kilometer uh, uh, as one fire pixel as compared to VS will tell them there are three different uh, fires. And we'll see that a little bit more when we go to the exercise, but this is uh, advantage of using VRs as compared to MODIS. Now let's look how this thermal anomaly or active fire or fire hotspot algorithm works in principle. So all of these satellite does make measurement in many different spectral channels. We call them bands, spectral bands. And the idea is that all the features in Earth atmosphere system response uh, in a diff little bit different ways in different spectral channels. So if we have measurement in many channels, uh, many bands or many bands of uh, solar spectrum, then we will be able to uh, get a lot more piece of information about certain things. In this case, we are talking about the fires. So the first thing we do is mask the water and mask the cloud pixels. So if there are water and there is a cloud, then we basically say, okay, this is a cloud or water and we will not be able to detect any fire in those cases. So this is done using thresholds on temperature, brightness temperature or reflectance. And these thresholds vary between daytime and nighttime. Okay, so that is the first task. Second is, detection of fire actually itself to do that um, there is a fixed threshold use on the brightness temperature on the fire band um, to identify the potential fire pixels so the fire band is typically located around four micro uh, micrometer um, it varies a little bit um, between different sensors but that is typical uh, central wavelength and again it use uh, complementary channels means there are 11 micron channel there are other channels which are used to actually uh, further enhance the uh, algorithm to detect these fires automatically and we'll go get into those channels a little bit uh, later once you detect the fire you want to make sure that this is the fire and this is not a false alarm false alarm means uh, if you detect a fire based on the threshold of brightness temperature, then that brightness temperature can happen also because of the other region. For example, if there is a huge solar panel form sitting in California and that can produce very high temperature, same as the fire temperature, and you will say, oh, there is a fire, but in reality, it is really a solar form solar panel form so to detect those to make sure that there are checks and balance in the algorithms uh, we check for the background we checks for these uh, fire free targeted which are typically constant uh, like coastal region deserts um, sometime very cleared forest uh, with the high reflectance and some artificial objects such as solar panels, solar form buildings, um, we have to remove them from the data set. So that, that is kind of a big picture uh, fire algorithm, how it works. Now, here are some more details. Again, I'm not going to get into all the details here, but this is a more like a reference slide. And if you need to really learn more about that, that link will provide you a lot more details on the fire detection algorithm. But in brief, we use all these different channels uh, to do different, perform different tasks uh, in process to make uh, detect the fires and may, uh, confirm that it is fire and not something else. Uh, this is specifically for MODIS. Uh, C6 means this is the latest collection six version of the algorithm. Uh, and then similar uh, channels are used for the VRs. The, the base algorithm between MODIS and VRs are uh, almost same. Uh, the channels, because there are some differences between different channels between MODIS and VRs, there can be few differences. So as you can note here, one thing is that VIRS has two fire channel. One is at 375 meter, uh, the channel I4, 355 to 393 micrometer, and then the M13 band, which is a 750 meter resolution, uh, which has 3.9 to 4.1 micrometer uh, range. So the, these two bands are simultaneously used to get active fire data uh, at both resolution, 
Uh, of course, because of the higher resolution of 375 meter, it produces more number of fires uh, compared to 750 meter resolution. Okay, so let's look a little bit more on this uh, hot spots or active fire data or thermal anomalies. So when I say these words, they all mean same. Active fire data or thermal anomalies or hot spots, they are all considered as same terminology for the of active fire detection. So the limitation, one of the limitation is the fall positive. What is false positive? Sometime what happens as I was explaining earlier, there are some features on the land surface, on the earth surface, which can provide similar signal as an active fire such as, so in those cases, um, satellite automated algorithm will say this is a uh, active fire, but there are check and balance to actually remove those big, uh, as uh, using a complementary data sets of either land classifications or building information or certain uh, satellite geometry information to make sure those are not uh, false positive. Uh, Sometimes large fire omissions due to the th thick smoke. What is that? So if you have a very thick smoke, like I was showing earlier in case of California, the entire area is covered with the blanket of a smoke. In those case, what happens is that the the temp the satellite is not able to detect the land temperature correctly, and that in those cases uh, it is uh, more likely that the algorithm will miss those location or detecting those fires if it is underneath those big plume. It's just like a, acting as a cloud. And then the large pixel size. So as I was mentioning earlier, I shown an example to compare between models and viewers. Uh, they have a relatively larger size pixel. So in case of MODIS, it's one by one kilometer. In case of ABI, it's two by two square kilometer. And this size actually changes. MODIS size can go to up to four, four by four kilometer at the edge of the swath. ABI can go up to nine, 10 by nine, 10 square kilometer at the edge of the disk. And if the pixel size is too big, and if there is not enough signal from the fires, if the fire size is very small, then this sensor will miss those fires. So people, um, the algorithm folks at the NASA and other agencies uh, always looking to validate this uh, data, how much we are actually accurate all around the world. And um, when they do the validation studies, they use uh, much higher resolution satellite data and other source of information. For example, Landsat spatial resolution is 30 meter or Sentinel is 10 meter and there are other sensors which have higher spatial resolution such as Aster. And they use those data sets to actually co-locate with this coarser resolution data sets to identify uh, what we missed in those uh, MODIS data or VS data or what we have not missed. And when they did this kind of validation studies, they found that the false alarm rate or it is typically called commission error is about 1.2%. So if you're detecting about 100 fires, uh, there is a chance that out of 100, you have one or two fires are false alarm. It means they are not really fires, but they're detected. Again, if you want to learn more about the limitations and accuracies, and the algorithm itself, these are the two links here for both MODIS and VIRS, and we can go over that. Um, you can go over the to get more details on these uh, um, two algorithms and data products. So another term I want to define, uh, often uh, in literatures and uh, media and people are interested is how many fires are burning. Right. And that is typically called fire count. So what is fire count? So the fire count is basically number of hotspots or satellite pixels detected by a particular satellite or sensor in certain regions. So for example, in this image, if I draw a box over this uh, state of uh, um, Washington or Oregon or California and count all the pixels which are classified as fire by particular satellite algorithm, then that will become 
my fire count. You will also have to see whether you want to do this fire counts on certain time window. So whether within last one hour, how many fires were detected or in last 24 hour, how many fires were detected or in last one year or one month. So you can play that game. And because of this different needs from the users, uh, the data product itself does not count this for you. What it gives you is latitude, longitude, and time of the those detection. And using that information, you can do that by yourself. And we'll see that once we get to the exercise part. You can also actually count the fires for individual uh, irregular polyno polygons such as country borders, district borders, state or county or for entire continents. So again, depending on your need, uh, you can make those fire count uh, calculation uh, by yourself and it is a relatively simple process. Okay, so let's uh, uh, look these three case studies, uh, which I have been telling earlier. Earlier, we looked the uh, RGB or true color images for these three cases. Uh, now, what I have done is I have superimposed the detected fire as a red dot on those images, and this we have done using the world view. So we will look, um, go to the world view and look these. Uh, case studies a little bit more in these data sets and how to display that and uh, evaluate uh, these fires in the world view. So this is the world view website. Um, uh, the link is given. Uh, this is a screenshot of the home page. Um, so we will uh, take, uh, I'll take you to the world view website and then we will do a quick uh, tour to the site. So now let's look at the, you know, some of these data sets which we talk both true color images, uh, the smoke images trees, and some of the fire active fire detection data, the hotspot product uh, and how to access them. So we are going to use a NASA tool called NASA Worldview. And the way I remember is just go to the search and then type NASA Worldview and the first link it will show up as a NASA world view. I'll just click on that and it will take me to the home page of this tool. And you can close this pop up window here. Basically, this is showing a lot of information about what is inside and a lot of different case studies which they have put together um, uh, for you. So I'm going to just close this and I will click on right most corner information and there is about and if you want to know about this tool, uh, I'll just briefly read the first paragraph so that you kind of understand what this tool is. So it's basically a tool uh, which where you can browse uh, near real time, full resolution satellite imageries and data layers. And also you can download some of these data. And there are about 900 different data layers available. So it's not limited to only fires or air quality in general. Uh, all aspect of Earth system, planet Earth, uh, are actually available, whether it's a disaster, precipitation, temperature, land use type, climate variables, anything. Uh, so there are 900 different data layers. And the one of the biggest uh, advantage of worldview is that most of the information is available within two to three hours of its uh, satellites overpass. Uh, more recently, they also have added some of the geostationary satellite data, which means you get more than one uh, measurement per day. Uh, so there's a lot of information uh, in this tool uh, available and not only for near real time, but the historical data also are archived. So you can read more about this uh, using this information. I just want to show a few more things on the information. Uh, it is an open source code, so if anybody wants to duplicate this in their own data layers, uh, they can download the code uh, and there are a uh, few other tutorials and other kind of information is available through this thing. Now, again, on the since we are on here on the top right corner, uh, you can take a snapshot. You can actually change the projection. Uh, there are three different projection and you can create a link uh, Whatever you are seeing on your screen, uh, 
uh, it will create a link to uh, to that and you can copy that link you can shorten you can share on social media so these are some of the tools available in the world view on the bottom is a uh, date uh, control tablet tape uh, where you can actually change the date uh, this arrow will take you back and forth in days it will change by one day you can directly change the date here by typing uh, you can change the date again here again by typing or using the arrow so i'm going to just go 2020 uh, remember when you first time open it will always displays latest image for that day so you will have to if you are going back in time you will have to change the date so i will change the date to september 2020 and let's say 11 that was the that was the image which we were looking earlier for the fires in western us you can also move the slider to change the date uh, if you want to uh, change the unit of this display you can change by year month and day this plus and minus signs will allow you to zoom in and out over certain area so you can go plus will zoom in to that area and minus is zoom out with this area now the most important part of this world view is this uh, left hand panel top right top left corner and there are three different tabs here layers events and data so the one which we are going to focus more on is called layers now in the layers when it by default there are two types of groups of layer one is called base layers in base layer we have four different satellite sensors uh, for which we have true color images are available one is called terra modis which makes measurement in the morning aqua modis which makes measurement in the afternoon veers on sumi and pp afternoon measurement and there is another veers on NOAA 20 which makes uh, 1240 measurement so these two veers makes measurement within 50 minutes of each other's and the two modis makes measurement within three hours of each other so you can based on your requirement you can choose which sensor you want to use as a best layer one advantage i want to tell between modis and veers is that you can see these big gaps in the satellite imagery so this is image from september 19 and you can see this huge black spot in the middle of the globe uh, around the equator these are called orbital gaps so you will see these in case of both modis either it's modis aqua or modis terra again these i symbol you see a line if it is line it means it is closed the layer is not displaying if the eyes is open it means the image is going to display and you can display more than one layer at a time um, uh, but the layer which is on the top will appear actually so this is modis aqua now if i switch to the veers then you will see that veers does not have those black lines right black spots which is there in the in case of modis so this is modis this is veers so the reason is that the veers swath is a little bit larger about 3000 kilometer compared to modis which is 2330 kilometer and that allows larger coverage and actually it's overlap some of the orbits uh, in case of you so some of the data which we are going to look is we will focus on the beers mostly so let's focus in uh, western us california washington and that part of the region that's where we are doing the case studies um, I have displayed the VIRS image for September 19. Uh, let's go to September 11, the image which we were looking earlier. And you can see. Uh, so this is true color image. You will see the clouds are appearing very bright white, so you can easily identify them. This is a land surface. And this particular features, uh, which is actually a uh, smoke plume transporting our ocean, um, is really really thick smoke plume and there may be some underneath cloud uh, that is smoke plume but on the top of the from the satellite it looks like a smoke plume and they are coming out from different fires and we will see in a minute how to look them now on the overlay uh, you have some uh, some of the legends some layers like places name which will allow you to navigate through the different parts of the world um, to identify where you are on the earth and then there is a coastline 
in borders. So if you want to see the borders in the state and countries, uh, this will allow you to do that. Now, you can also use, there is a search option on the top right. You can put some name, uh, city name, uh, like San Francisco, right? And it will take you to San Francisco and zoom into that area. Will give you. You can also put the latitude longitude here, and it will take you to that place. Again, I'm going to zoom out and um, just focus on the entire uh, west coast. Okay. Uh, now we are going to add some layers. So, add layers. Once I click that, a pop-up window will appear, and what it does is. Uh, it uh, separate those 900 data layers, which I was telling earlier, into different categories. Uh, and these categories are defined by disaster name, hazard type, or the science discipline, for example, atmosphere, biosphere, cryospheres, or featured, some of these featured stories. So we are going to just stick to the first one, hazard and disaster. And since we are talking about the fires and air quality, We'll just stick to this particular window. Now, in this, if you look, uh, there is a product which we were discussing earlier called fires and thermal anomalies. I'll click on that. Once you click on that, you will see several options here. So these are the different satellite. You remember we talked about two modes, two viewers. So these are the different satellite which you can select. So I'm going to select aqua modis. And now again, you can see there is a layer which says day and night, means it's combined day and night, and there is, it says day and night. So I'm just for time being, I'm going to, to show a few things. I'll just select day and night both. Similarly, I'll click on the wear, Sumi and people wears. Uh, again, I will select day layer separately and night layer separately. You can also select them together. So the board data will display in the same but just to see some of the differences between day and night, I'll just uh, select them separately. Once you select them, you can also read details about those product, how you got the reference guide and everything on the right side. So there's a lot of information available here. In addition to these layer, uh, I'm going to also select uh, another parameter uh, called aerosol optical depth. Uh, which we will talk about in a little bit uh, later part of the presentation. But uh, since we are on the world view, I just want to show an example. Again, many different sensors which provide aerosol optical depth. So I'm going to just stick to SUMI and PP viewers. And the first one I will pick. Uh, and we will discuss what these different layers are in a little bit. But just for sake of world view, again, you can read what is aerosol optical depth, what details available, algorithm, all kind of information is available here. Once you selected all those, make sure you have this uh, right sign and then you go on the top right corner, click that cross sign and just close that. All the layers which you have selected, they should appear on the overlay window here. And by default, all of them will be displayed on the uh, your top of those your base layer. Now I'm going to just close them just so that we can see one layer at a time and what it means okay so right now it is just displaying the rgb or the true color images from sumi and pp you can actually close that also if you just don't want that kind of a background you can just have a, this nice black background so let's use this background for time being and then we'll come back to the true color image so first we will display aqua modis this is aqua modis so all the red dots started appearing in this region. And you can actually, if you want to see a bigger global view, you can look at this and you will see there are a lot of fires happening during the same time in this part of uh, Africa. There were a lot of fire in Amazon, other parts of the world. But let's get back to the San Francisco or the California area uh, here in the Western US. So you see these fires. Now let me, this is aqua modis means these are afternoon fire detection during the daytime. And again, these are the nighttime fires. So you can see one thing is very clearly, some of these fires are seen in nighttime, but not in the daytime. So there can be two things happens. One is either these uh, 
fires started late in the day and they are more active in the night time or sensor is not able to detect them because of not of the enough signal so always nighttime fire detection is better than the daytime okay now if i close the modis uh, fire layer and display the veers fire so this is veers daytime layer and this is modis daytime layer so you can see the difference this is modis this is veers modis and veers you can see clearly because of the higher spatial resolution, Veers is detecting a lot more fires compared to uh, models. And both are daytime. And remember, both are making measurement within 15 minutes of each other. So it is not like they are um, making measurement several hours apart. So the one thing which we were noticing earlier between uh, just Modis Terra and Equa or the Modis uh, uh, day and night, we were thinking that it may happen as those fires started late, but actually that is not the case because Veers at the same time within 15 minutes detected these fires which were not actually detected by Modis uh, uh, daytime fires. So it means because of the higher spatial resolution, uh, Veers were able to detect these fires. So each of these red dot is one fire. So you can actually zoom in uh, for example, here you see a cluster, um, uh, cluster of fires or line of fires, right? So, for example, you can zoom in in any of this area, you will see these dots are very small, right? And if you click on each of these dots, then a window will pop up, and that window will give you exact location of those fires where the fires are detected in terms of their latitude, longitude. It will also provide all of the active fire data, actually, which we will download a little bit later in the presentation, like brightness temperature, those temperature threshold I was telling you earlier in the algorithm, fire radiative power, which actually allow us to know how big the fire is, how intense the fire is, the intensity of fires, and it is defined in Megabot. And then there are other uh, type of information like how big the pixel size uh, is in long term. So if you multiply these two number, you will get uh, area of the pixel which where the fires is detected. And then whether this fire was day or night time, since we are already looking at daytime image, so it's a daytime fire only. And then the confidence level, right? So algorithm will tell you whether it's very confident in detecting the fires or nominal or high. So this was considered as a nominal. Code. And then there are other information uh, available for time of the observation, date of the observation. And all this date and time information is available in UTC, GMT time. So if you need to convert that into your local time, you will make, uh, you will have to make that correction. Okay, so let's go get back to this. Uh, uh, we already looked the differences between MODIS and VIRS capabilities, and we also looked the differences between the uh, day and night. Now let me just show from the VIRS alone how the day and night things work. So this is VIRS night time and this is VIRS daytime. So you can see that night time has a little bit more fires and some of the other, um, so for example, this is night time and then let me close and this is daytime. So you can see that the density of the fire within that area is a little bit less in daytime fire detection because night time there is a strong signal the contrast is higher and that is why it is easier to detect uh, more fires in night time also in addition to that you can see that some of the fires which are detected in daytime for example this is specific fire here 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 they are actually not detected in the nighttime image so this fire is gone in night time so that may be there may be some uh, small fires happening uh, which were just burning for a few hours and gone uh, so the night time is not able to detect those fires. So this is just California again. And again, if you look the global map, uh, like I was saying earlier, it looks like the entire world is on fire. But again, you can zoom in to this specific area. The another case study which we were talking is from Zambia. Again, uh, if you look this map, it looks like the whole region is burning, right? But it is not. So again, you zoom in, in in the country, you will see there are so many fires, but these are very small agriculture fires, few square 
kilometer of land is burning and providing enough signal to detect it as a fires. Again, uh, we learned about the fire count earlier. So if you actually help, um, if you actually uh, count all the red dots in certain box, for example, let's say uh, this box, right? Um, let's let's assume um, this is your box, right? So you you can actually calculate the number of fires in this box, and that will become fire count. Unfortunately, this tool does not allow you to do that, but uh, we will see that uh, in other ways how to do that. Okay. Now, let me show you uh, some of the RGVs a little bit closely uh, for that region. Um, so we are going back to allow the SUMI and PP viewers. Again, I was showing you the difference between the agriculture fire and forest fires. The smoke is very thin, and if you actually zoom into the smaller area, then you can see that there are so many small smoke plumes coming out of from these fires. And we can actually superimpose the fire detection uh, on these, and you will see uh, many of these smoke plumes are corresponds to those fire locations uh, where the, the fires are happening currently. Now we are going to move on and do a uh, take a look of another tool uh, called fire information for resource management system firms uh, this is a uh, tool uh, by nasa uh, it allows you to download some of the fire data which we looked in the world view and do more further analysis so again uh, to to get into the tool, I will follow the same process. And we will actually uh, type uh, NASA uh, and the tool's name is firms. So once you type NASA firms, the first website comes up for information for resource management system. And once I click on that, it will take me to the home page. So uh, click on the uh, forms uh, uh, map and then it will take me to this website. So this is their home page. And uh, what you see, some of those capabilities which we saw in the world view is similar here, but it is a dedicated tool for fire monitoring. So it has a little bit more information than world view is allowing you to do. So again, uh, the in terms of the Features are very similar. You have on the right side a panel where you can select different data layers. So, you know, first quick view is going to allow you to see uh, one day data or past 24 hour data. Uh, and then uh, you can select, like we saw earlier, there are four different satellite sensors which are available for fire detection two modes two views you can select which one you want to use i'm going to for sake of this uh, demo i'm going to just select modes the viewers sumi npp and then you can also there are background layer and overlay which are available which you can display so again it's very similar to what you see in world view the only difference here is the by default the base layer here is a surface reflectance product uh, and you can actually change that so these are the layers you can actually change what you want uh, i think the blue marble is by default but you can change the street which you cannot do in world view so if you are more interested in the physical location you can also change to some other light gray dark gray it it, it does have a little bit more uh, pictures to show in the background what is uh, that will probably sometime helps you but what is burning underneath okay so again once you open this is going to be your view but if you click on the advanced uh, it does allow you a little bit more uh, you, the advanced features allow you to go back in time so uh, we are just going to go back uh, from uh, september of 2020 and the September 11 case when we were looking some of the fires in California and West Coast and in Africa. And then um, again, you can select which layer you want to display here. So, and now 
this tool allow you to display accumulated data for up to 30 days so right now it is displaying for one day but you can change that to two days three days and up to 31 days so and you can do that change actually also by just selecting this uh, window here but remember this only allows you to display data for up to 30 days only so you can see a lot more files are displayed uh, as you started accumulating those files for a lot many days uh, and as you go on short number of days less number of files are going to display it here okay so i'm going to just do the one day one right now for time being another aspect of display here is a uh, gridded product and if you go down on this panel there is gridded fire hotspot if you click here again you can select whether you want uh, right now it does not have viewers from nova 20 which is available on the individual file but it has more is Quartera and viewers so i'm going to select viewers mpp and what this gridded product does is basically it counts the number of fires uh, in quarter degree by quarter degree latitude of longitude box so you make a box so for example if i zoom into california here again uh, the fires which we were looking earlier right so you see this each box this is about quarter degree by quarter degree in latitude and longitude and they are color coded by number of fires which are detected in that period so this is fire count which i was explaining earlier and this color scale is given here so it varies from 0 to 100 but the red color is not really restricted to 100 anything above 100 is also red color and this is for one day only now you can change this also to 10 days so you will see suddenly uh, the number of fires will increase now it is almost 4000 fires in this particular uh, grid box or 171 fires for this grid box so you can change that depending on your requirement uh, one day uh, it will show only for one day how many fires were detected so this is a nice feature of forms that uh, in certain cases you can actually calculate the fire uh, counts but again this is fixed grid of quarter degree by quarter degree so you cannot change that now there is another nice tool uh, which I want to show uh, here there is a burnt area product also available but I will not discuss that a little bit more because you will be going to introduce this product more in uh, session 5 and 6 and uh, we will see uh, this tool at that time but let's go back to this quick view and I want to show a couple of more features from that mm, so I will display the data uh, let's see sorry we can go to the advanced view itself and remove the gridded data and there are certain tools available here one is called measure so if you click on the measure you can actually measure the area or the distance between fires in different units so let's say I want to actually see how big area is burning uh, around this particular uh, area so let me click actually let me zoom in first to this particular area right i want to calculate how much area is burning uh, and again this is a very rough estimate this is not same as the burnt area but this is a quick and dirty way to get a sense of how much area is burning so you click on the area and then basically start mapping uh, this area uh, where the fire is burning and you can make any any kind of irregular polygon uh, in this one and it will calculate the area underneath uh, that polygon so i'm just making a rough here uh, thing so if all the area which is burning in this region is about 33 square kilometer and you can change in hectares so it's almost like 3000 hectares uh, of land burning and again this is not same as burnt area remember this is just a rough estimate how the things are happening so this is one visual part of forms now let's move on to the other parts of forms uh, which are uh, more critical for downloading and analyzing the data so 
Uh, again, if you go here on the left side, this, this is the one which we were looking so far. Uh, they have a very specific site for US and Canada and um, there is a little bit more information you can browse that and then click on the Actifier data. So this is where you download the data. Again, a lot of information is available. Uh, they divided the world in different parts which are displayed here in different colors. Uh, South Asia, Central America, Alaska. So you can actually download the data in three different format. Uh, uh, shape files, Google Earth, uh, KMZ file which you can display in Google Earth uh, and then the text file CSV which you can open in the uh, Excel. So we are going to work with this Excel shape files to look some of this data and you can download the world Canada or any of the files. Uh, now there are three different uh, ways in which the data is available. Uh, MODIS one kilometer. When I say MODIS it includes both Terra and Aqua. Uh, and then the Veers Sumi and PP and Veers NOAA 20. Uh, you can download the data for past 24 hours or you can download the data for past 48 hours or past seven days. So this is Actifier data for real time application. Uh, so let me just download one of the file actually and I have already downloaded the file. I'm going to just open that for you uh, to save the time. And when you download and open the file in Excel, it looks like this. Uh, I am not sure whether you can see it clearly or not. Let me just in increase the zoom level. So when you open that file, you will see this piece of information. Latitude, longitude, brightness, temperature, uh, scan and track. These are the size of the pixel where the fire is detected. So again, if you multiply the two of them, you will get the pixel area. This is the date of uh, accretion means when the fire is detected. Again in UTC, UTC time uh, or GMT, the name of the satellite. So again remember the instrument is MODIS same but this, there are two satellites, Terra, Morning and Aqua. So depending on which satellite detected the fire. And then the confidence level, it varies from 0 to 100. Close to 100 is better confidence, uh, close to 0 is lower confidence. Uh, there's some other information which is used in the algorithm was in number temperature. This FRP is the parameter which tells you the uh, in megawatt the intensity of the fires. It will tell you whether it's daytime or nighttime. D means daytime and for nighttime and the type of fires is also defined. So uh, if it is vegetation, this is zero. If it is non vegetation, then some other number is given and all that information you can find in the user guide. So this is how the data will look when you download from here. Now this is one way of getting near real time data but there are uh, other ways to get the uh, there is a fire alert also. So you can sign up by entering your email and then create a request create fire alert. So it will tell you uh, name uh, where you want to country area you can select uh, and how you want to get the alerts that will give you an automatic fire alert. So let's get back to the original site uh, and then archive download. This is another thing I want to show you is if you want to download the data from past year, past month or for several years together, this is where you go. Um, one of the things they have done nicely here is you can actually download the yearly summary of uh, entire country data. So again separated by MODIS and VIRS. Uh, MODIS is starting from 2000 to 2019. Again 2020 data are not yet processed in this format but you can get those data in another way. I will show you in a minute. You can get all the countries as a zip file uh, or you can click on the year and just select individual countries. So for example uh, one of the cases today which we were doing was from Zambia. You can search Zambia. Here is Zambia. You can click on this file. It's 16 MB file and it will download in the data format will be the exactly the same which we saw earlier. Now one more thing uh, we can do from this data file which we were downloading earlier is the fire count calculation, right? So let's say uh, you want to calculate how many number of fires are there. So you can actually put uh, do a quick uh, Excel trick where you filter the data 
and then you can put the range of latitude and longitude here uh, and based on that range you can actually count how many files so for example on this particular day for this particular files there were 11 fires which were detected by both and nodes. Now you can say I want to just see what how many fires were detected by aqua only. So I select the aqua and then it will tell me okay there were uh, eight fires were aqua and the remaining three were stellar. You can similarly do separation by day and night. So there are many different ways in which you can do this is just a simple example using the Excel spreadsheet but you can write a program in Python or any other language you're familiar and you can use some of the GIS tool also to do similar task. Okay, uh, so this is where you download the countrywide file, but uh, let me show you another way to download more specific data while creating a create new request. So when you go to the create new request, you select whether you want the worldwide data or individual country data or the custom region, right? So if you do the custom region, it will select, it will get to the map and let's say I want to download the data from this region. So uh, I will draw a polygon or a draw a custom box here over this region. And I'm showing you just because we are going to use this data a little bit later uh, to show a case study. So you will download the data for this, save, and then it actually took the boundaries of lat long here and provided. Now you can select the source of the data, whether it's MODIS data or VIRS, SUMI NPP or NOAA 20. So I'm going to just say SUMI NPP. You can select the date. Again, we were working with the August and September data. So I'll just select August 1 uh, and then 2020. September 30. Again, there is no restriction here. You can select 20 years. Uh, it's just the data volume become large uh, when you do. Now you can select the output file. Like I said earlier, there are three different formats. Um, in downloading, uh, instead of KMZ, they provide the JSON, which is more um, useful for displaying on web services. So comma separated CSV, and then you put your email address and submit. And once you submit, your records will appear here. You will get an email uh, with the link of downloading data. You should get two email. One is the notification that you submitted your uh, order with the details. And the second, once the data is ready, which typically happens within within few minutes, uh, depending on data volume, it may be a few hours. But And then you will download the data and analyze in the same way as we were doing. If you click on the web service, it will provide you all the details about how you can display these data in more automated fashion on your own website or on your own tools. So there's a lot of information available uh, here uh, for different purposes. So again, this is a really nice tool to analyze the data and I'll show you a case study uh, as we move on uh, using the data from this from website. Okay, so let's move on to the next topic, which is smoke detection. We did talk about that a little bit uh, uh, from the visual perspective using the world view and RGB image, but I want to get a little bit more into how we do that in automatic sense and what are the data sets available to actually do more in you know, automatic fashions or quantitative ways. So again, uh, as we saw in the world view, uh, depending on what kind of fuel is burning and depending on how big the fire is, what is background level is, uh, what kind of particle they are emitting, where they are in the atmospheres, satellite spectral response uh, uh, will be a different. It means the true color images can appear different or those features will appear either different in colors or shape or their spectrum. So in this, we have uh, four different example on the uh, top left. We already saw that case from the small fires in Zambia, where the smoke appears more transparent, but more of hazy. Uh, on the right, you see those wildfire smoke plumes, which we saw in case of California. Uh, on the top, on the bottom left, you see in another example, which we haven't seen earlier, is uh, 
uh, smoke from the oil fires and this is from the Iraq and since the oil fire oil is very fires are dominated the emissions are dominated by the black particles or black carbon which are very absorbing in nature in these wavelength where we are making this rgbs uh, they appear very dark and black in colors similarly you have another example over uh, bangladesh and india where uh, the smoke is actually mixed with the local pollution uh, coming from the urban and that is creating a kind of a uh, a smog type features uh, which appears as a haze uh, in this satellite imagery. So these different uh, sh uh, color um, actually allow us to uh, get some more details about these fires. Here is another example how we use different bands or different spectral information uh, to detect the smoke uh, from the satellite. So on the left, these images are created using the Landsat satellite. On the left, you have a RGB, the true color image where you can see the smoke and land surface features. Um, again, we use the uh, image three bands, red, green, and blue to create the image on the left. On the right, uh, you have the same lens uh, measurement taken at the same place by the same satellite, but in different spectral channel or the band. Uh, we assigned 1.6 micron to red channel, 1.2 to green channel, and 2.1 micron to blue channel. Now remember, these are all smaller wavelength for the in the left. On the right, all of them are higher wavelength means they are larger than one micrometer so now you can see that the smoke is almost not visible uh, on the right image which was very prominent on the left size image and you can't see actually land underneath it but you can see the land underneath uh, the right image and the reason for that the smoke particles are typically very small so they response more to the smaller wavelength compared to the larger wavelength. In the larger wavelength, most of them are typically uh, transparent and that actually, so if we have a measurement of these in different wavelength bands, uh, we can actually using the combination of these bands, we can use this information to make more uh, automated decision. And that's what we are going to do uh, next. So here is just an example of how the spectral signature uh, or the spectral response varies by different features. So when you have to detect the smoke, as we saw in the earlier algorithm discussion, that we need to make sure we are separating other features. So sometime um, a smoke can be actually uh, easily mixed with the dust and other aerosols particles. So we need to make sure we have that information. Uh, and there are clear uh, space, right? Means uh, there is no smoke or dust. There may be some other type of aerosols are available there, or there's nothing there. So, um, so to do that, uh, what you see here on the left, again, this is taken from a data product, which we are going to discuss later on. And the details of that data product is defined in this document PDF, which is given the link here. Uh, what you see here on the left is the reflectance measured in 412 nanometer on the x-axis and the ratio of 412 to 414 nanometer, which is a blue channel on the y-axis. And there are three different types of uh, uh, features which are uh, manually picked to make this plot. Uh, one is the clear sky blue, means it shows very, um, very small reflectance, 15, 16 percent, but the ratio of the blue 412 to uh, 440 is very high, larger than 1.24. And then the smoke, which is a red color pixels, and then the dust on the right. So both smoke and dust shows high values of 412, right? But if you see the ratio, the ratio is kind of separating the two. Um, the ratio, the and the, the difference in this ratio is a function of the absolute value in 412. So it is decreasing, or we can, in other words, we can say the contrast between smoke and dust is changing as a function of uh, reflectance in 412. So this this kind of information, this kind of separation in a spectral space, allow us to actually uh, automatically detect, uh, put those threshold values uh, to detect uh, this smoke and dust automatically in the satellite imageries. 
Now, using this left side, we can actually separate the clear versus smoke and dust, but it will may be difficult to separate smoke and dust. So for that, if you see, um, remember earlier, the dust particles are larger in size, typically larger than one micron, uh, whereas the smoke particles are smaller, they are typically smaller than one micron or some micron particles. So again, you have 412 on x-axis and reflectance and 2.1 micron channel. So again, you remember earlier Landsat image, we were looking that smoke is almost transparent to this 2.1 micron channel. And that is what happening. You can see all those red pixels, which are classified as smoke. They are having very low reflectance, less than 2%. Clear sky is also having very low reflectance in 2.1 micron, whereas the dust, which are larger in size, particle size is pretty big. They are responding very well to 2.1 micron channel. So now use combining the spectral information from these three channels. Not only we can actually separate smoke and dust particle from the clear sky, but we can also separate them uh, individually between dust and smoke. And that is exactly what this product is doing while calculating these two parameters called absorbing aerosol index. And this is defined by this equation, which is nothing but those ratios which we saw earlier, but uh, it is defined in logarithmic scales. And this R is reflectance in those channel as measured by the satellite and the R dash is a uh, clear sky reflectance, um, uh, which is calculated using a ready to transfer calculation for Rayleigh scattering. So this is uh, this whole quantity is called absorbing aerosol index. Uh, when the value of this uh, AAI is positive, it means there are absorbing aerosol in, aerosols present in the image. And but it both dust and smoke can be absorbing. So uh, alone this will not help you to distinguish between smoke and dust it will help you to distinguish between absorbing and non-absorbing type of particle so there is another parameter which is calculated called smoke dust discrimination index and this is based on the another figure which we i showed earlier the ratio of 412 to 2.2 micron channel because again dust is responding to 2.1 whereas the smoke is transparent transparent to 2.2 micron channel again it is on logarithmic scales defined in very same way as aai so together these uh, if you put thresholds on aai and dsdi then we can actually not only uh, define uh, dust um, uh, separate the dust and smoke but we can also quantify their thickness so again all of the details are given in this documented which is ATVT and published papers and here on this image is just showing an august 15 2020 case from again from the fires in uh, in uh, in, in northern US uh, here, uh, dust aerosol index and the smoke aerosol index are defined here. Again, the uh, magenta color shows the strength or the thickness of the smoke. And we'll look some more example. So all this uh, AAI, DS, uh, DI, uh, and some of these detection flags are stored in a data set called aerosol detection product. And this is from the NOAA. Uh, so the data is available through another website, which I will show you in a minute. Uh, it includes those aerosol index. It also includes flag means that it basically tell you whether it's a dust or a smoke or clear or cloud or a snow or a volcanic ash plume. It also gives you the quality flag, whether how much the algorithm is because we make several assumptions while making this uh, calculation and as you saw in the scatter plot there can be overlaps on a spectral signature between different classes such as smoke and dust and those can create some of the issues in certain viewing angles for the satellite and certain other environment condition so we based on those assumptions and based on the encountered conditions we assign uh, flag which is called low medium and high high means you are very confident low means you are less confident so this data is all stored in this file uh, the example file name is given this comes in a net cdf format unfortunately this does not come in a ascii file uh, because the data volume is pretty large each of this pixel is 375 meter uh, 
uh, big so there's a lot of pixels um, and um, this data you can download from the NOAA. Uh, you can also display this uh, smoke and dust product from a several visualization tool one is called aerosol watch which is earlier I showed you uh, the data can be downloaded from NOAA class the link is given here and there is some RSET training material which we have done earlier. Uh, you can also visualize this uh, on a JSTAR mapper, which is a very similar to Worldview, uh, but designed by NOAA. And this tool actually allow you to display uh, some of this uh, data product which are uh, came out from the NOAA uh, on aerosols, fires, smoke, and few others, uh, including the tropome. So I will not go through the tool, but it is very simple, very similar to Worldview. You should be able to display uh, the data easily here. Okay, now let's move on to the aerosols data, uh, which are um, uh, the one which I introduced earlier during the Worldview aerosol optical depth. So what is aerosol optical depth? So it is defined um, it's an optical property of aerosols and it is defined for the entire column of the atmosphere from the surface to top of the atmosphere. Again, we have a lot of training material on this specific topic on our said website. So if you need to look a little bit more details, please browse other training material uh, and we will be able to help you to point out those specific. Uh, here is a technical definition of uh, aerosol optical depth uh, express the quantity of light at certain wavelength so it is always defined at certain wavelength removed by aerosols from the beam by scattering and absorption during its path through a medium so basically in bottom line as aerosol, as light penetrate from upper atmosphere to the lower atmosphere all these aerosols particles are present in the atmosphere which interact with that light and some of that light is actually lost in the space either by absorption or by scattering and basically how much light is lost or taken out by this particle is nothing but defined by quantity called aerosol optical depth this is a mathematical term here m is a solar zenith angle function of solar zenith angle uh, it defines uh, it's also called air mass and basically tells uh, where the sun in the um, horizon uh, Aerosol optical depth is also called AOD or AOT in short form. T stands for thickness. Uh, typically, most sensors report it at 550 nanometer and it's a unit less quantity. Um, so aerosol optical depth, either you can get from the ground measurement called sun photometer. Uh, here are examples are given. There are huge network. I will show you in a minute uh, or you can get from the satellite. Now, since we're talking about the air quality, so there is a, um, another term in air quality community we often use to define the amount of particle in the atmosphere is called PM 2.5 mass concentration. And there are similarities and differences between aerosol optical depth and PM 2.5. And I want to uh, make sure we understand that. So again, like I mentioned earlier, aerosol optical depth is defined for the entire column of the atmosphere. Uh, whereas the surface PM 2.5, which is measured at the ground, is only uh, near the surface layer, the nearest layer of the atmosphere uh, uh, close to the instrument. Aerosol optical depth is averaged over certain area. So in this case, if uh, depending on what resolution we are using, the data sets are available in different resolution. I'll show you, uh, but it represents larger spatial averaging over, uh, over Earth surface, whereas the PM 2.5 is measured at as a point location. So it represents only point measurement. Uh, aerosol optical depth is a optical quantity. So it represents how the light interact with the aerosols uh, and it represent all size and shape range of particles whereas this pm 2.5 are uh, specifically designed uh, to make measurement of particles which are less than 2.5 micrometer in aerodynamic diameter these pm 2.5 are also dry mass uh, under controlled humidity condition of 35 to 40 percent whereas the aerosol optical depth is ambient uh, condition means whatever if there is water vapor it will have effect on aerosol optical so there are these are some of the differences and similarities but both represent um, uh, amount of pollution in the atmosphere 
and uh, often many studies have used aerosol optical depth as a proxy for PM 2.5 and there are uh, data sets which are coming up uh, on PM 2.5 based on the aerosol optical depth measurement and we'll show them uh, few later in the example. So like fire data there are many satellite and sensors which provide aerosol optical depth and some other parameter uh, again MODIS, uh, MISER, OMI, TROP OMI, OMS, they, these are some of the names which you might be familiar. In some of these sensors, in addition to aerosol optical, they also provide additional information. For example, MISER um, also can provide you some uh, sense of particle size bins, whether the particles are smaller, medium, or coarse. Similarly, OMI, OMS, or TROP OMI can actually give you a little bit more information on absorbing type of aerosols and in some cases aerosol layer height, uh, wears, and then we have several geostationary which came along in last three to five years, uh, which does provide a PM2, uh, aerosol optical depth and a smoke mass, which we saw earlier. Uh, there are some regional estimates of PM2.5. These are still a research product, uh, but more, are, more, more of them are coming online uh, as we learn more about AOD and PM2.5 relationship. In future, there will be a lot more sensor which will have similar capabilities and more advanced capabilities. Uh, some of them is, are part of this global air quality constellation of satellite. Uh, 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 Tempo, Sentinel, GEMS in Asia. Maya is another mission which will actually provide a lot more information and PM2.5 product at very high resolution over several targeted urban location all around the world. So there's a lot of satellite data on aerosols available which can be used uh, to monitor smoke uh, from fires. So using these data sets, uh, uh, there is a product uh, uh, calculated by, VIA, by NOAA. Uh, it's called derived PM2.5 from mode for aerosol from aerosol optical depth. And these are based on a relationship between AOD and PM2.5 uh, mathematical uh, relationship based on a regression equation. And these regression equations are actually calculated based on the air now data and details on this method is published in this paper by uh, Heizeng and Shova uh, in just a few months back. And what you see here in this example on the left is a aerosol optical depth from Veers on October uh, 7, 2020 over US and then use that aerosol optical depth using the regression model which are de derived uh, using air norm measurement on the right side is the PM 2.5. So you can see areas with high aerosol optical depth corresponds to areas with the high PM 2.5 concentration. And in some areas, for example, over here, over you know, Washington state here, aerosol optical depth values looks very high, but the PM 2.5 values are not high. And there could be two things going on here. One is uh, estimated PM 2.5 could be a little bit wrong. Or the second one is it could also happen that these smoke plumes are transporting in upper atmosphere above the boundary layer and not PM2.5, which is a surface measurement is not affected on the ground. So this is again a research product. It is available through Worldview website, which I showed earlier, and you can actually visualize some of these uh, here. Here is some validation, initial validation result over US. Um, this is from Veers and the avi so on the left is your avi ghost satellite geostationary on the right is veers uh, you can see the statistics are very similar and again the aerosol watch allow you to display some of this data into their tool okay so uh, so far uh, we have learned a lot about active fire data true color images some of the aerosols data uh, which are out there available from various satellite sensors. Uh, I understand that I have gone a little bit fast on the aerosol data sites. Uh, but what we are going to do now is we will put all this information together to understand a one air quality uh, case study or an event, how we use this data together to understand, to analyze uh, 
uh, an air quality event and for this uh, i have chosen a case study uh, from uh, fires in western us so what you see here on the left again i have created all this analysis using the data sets and tools which have i demonstrated earlier so on the left all of these images are created on the top one using the world view and the bottom images i created using the noah j star mapper which i have provided the link what we have not gone to the website so the first one is the true color images the red dots are the fire hotspot detected on september 9 uh, the second one is the viewers aerosol optical depth uh, again the red color shows high values the orange and yellow color shows low values it's a unitless quantity you can see some of the smoke areas are not um, detected in aerosol optical depth product or not uh, retrieve the values uh, the hot spots alone are detected by the viewers you can see the clusters of fires they are uh, everywhere uh, across california several places in orange orange oregon and washington and other places and then the night lights which we did talk a little bit but we haven't shown really anything on that but again you can actually access this various night light data from uh, world view what you can see in the night lights actually if you superimpose this together you can see all these huge amount of light coming out from the same place where there are fire detected as well as you can see some uh, cloudy like shape on the over ocean this is basically uh, reflected light either moonlight or some other light uh, which is reflected actually uh, from this thick plume of smoke and which is visible to the satellite so all this information we can use together to look different aspect uh, of these fires uh, both uh, on the surface and in the earth during day time and night time and on the bottom is aerosol index which i showed an example earlier and this is derived from trop omi sensor which is an european sensor uh, flying on sentinel 5 p satellite and what you see on the aerosol index is that uh, as i was mentioning earlier it is calculated using the measurement itself it is not a retrieved quantity but a calculated quantity and it is available under cloudy or non cloudy conditions so you can see the spatial extent of the data in aerosol index much larger compared to aerosol optical depth although aerosol index data to use quantitatively it's much more difficult because there are a lot more variable which can affect that value uh, compared to the aerosol optical depth so but it does have um, its own advantage and uh, both in terms of the spatial coverage and um, strength Another thing which we are going to use is the data which we downloaded from the firm. So I showed you an example of how to do that. And this is just an example of the CSV file. Uh, when I draw a box around this Western US uh, and I chose the data from 2018 to 2020, August, September month, uh, and you get this Excel type spreadsheet file. And I use that data to make a time series of fire count. So basically, uh, I took the data and calculated the number of fire which I showed earlier how to do that and made a time series and you can do this in Excel you can do in other coding language uh, I did a, using coding language but you can also draw this in Excel so on y-axis you have a fire counts and different colors shows the different years 2018 19 and 20 and this is for the entire year so the idea here is to show that uh, in the western us first you can see the number of fires are much much higher in 2020 compared to 19 or 18 so this can be an anomalous year uh, in the past three years second you can see that the most of the fires are actually concentrated in the uh, august september time frame so i zoomed in this particular region into this plot on the right and you can see the in 2020 um, there are two peaks in fires one happens around uh, third week of august after august 18 and then another one in the first week of september around september 9 10 and these two uh, peaks uh, are very very high in terms of number of fires they are 
much larger than what you saw in previous two year. So this is again you can do easily using form website. Now also uh, I wanted to see the difference between August and September as you can see the number of fires are much smaller in August as compared to the September and if you look the spatial distribution of those fire density map which we saw in the forms uh, then you can see most of the fires were concentrated in California region in August month but as you move to the September these fires actually started propagating to the north and you started seeing a lot more fire in Oregon and Washington with these uh, red colors value which are the fire count larger than 100 again done using the form website as we saw earlier now uh, this is the uh, aerosol index from the tropomy the similarly the one which i showed earlier an example uh, this is we got from noah j star mapper which i have provided the link earlier and what this does is that it helps you to see how the smoke from these fires uh, is actually transporting and this is very similar to what another example we saw using a another satellite instrument so you see this strength of using many different satellites that you can actually confirm uh, that one satellite is giving and another satellite is giving the same information that's another incredible things to see cross verify uh, what is happening in the earth atmosphere system and how this move is transporting now we talked about the geostationary satellite and getting that data using the aerosol watch earlier uh, again the links is provided in previous way and as i was saying earlier the advantage of using the geostationary is that it provide very frequent measurement so in this loop what you're seeing is those true color imageries of the fires and the smoke uh, in the western u.s taking every five minutes. So the GOES R sensor, which took this measurement, uh, makes every five minute measurement. So you can see that not only from day to day, how smoke is transporting as we saw in earlier example, like this one, but within day or within hours, how in which part of the country the smoke is actually moving. And this particular information from geostationary is super super helpful for the air quality forecaster for the weather forecaster for the emergency management people for other folks who really wants to get real time information and that another advantage of this information from geostationary is that because of its uh, uh, 5 minute repetitivity uh, the latency in the data is 15 20 minute only so you get the data within 15 20 minute of satellite measurement and that really helps uh, and we will look at this a little bit more in session four when we talk about the air quality forecast and how the geostationary measurement can uh, change the air quality forecasting in very different way. Okay, so we looked all the examples from different satellite and sensors, um, uh, the how the smoke and the fires look. Uh, now let's see what EPS ground-based measurement are saying because. Uh, satellite data always required to validate against the ground measurement because ground measurements are considered the gold standard ground truth. Yeah. So as you look, this is a loop of aeros uh, PM 2.5 uh, air quality index uh, from AirNow website and the link is given here. And you can see that during the different days of September, air quality in the Western US was affected. Um, and in some days when there was transport, long distance transport, other parts of the U.S. was also getting affected. So you can see this uh, central U.S. and up to Alabama, actually, you can see certain days when their quality got affected. So you can see this. And when you do this, look this uh, data together with the satellite data, you can actually track the transport pattern and how it is affecting the and quantify even actually how much uh, air quality is degraded because of this uh, smoke transport. So let's put together, uh, this is just one example. Uh, I zoomed in into the uh, uh, area around the Napa Valley where a lot of fires were happening. 
uh, and this is a RGB loop again created using world view. So you can see how the smoke from the fires here uh, transporting in different direction, either inland or over water, or um, even in the inland in different parts of the country, in different parts of the region, based on the wind pattern. And that will actually affect their quality differently in surrounding regions. So uh, if you take the EPS measurement of PM2.5, this is 24 hour mean PM2.5 ground measurement uh, taken on one of the station here in the Napa County, uh, then you will see that during the September, uh, the values of PM2.5 were pretty high, up to 150 microgram per cubic meter. And if you have seen the news outlet, you have, might have seen the pictures of uh, uh, Golden Beach showing in very different color than usually it looks, uh, just because of the thick layer of smoke covering the entire region. So again, ground measurements are conferring very high PM2.5 values. We already looked the fire counts, were showing very, very high values here. Uh, the number of fires are in several hundreds. Um, thousands of fires were detected. And if you look the aerosol optical depth, which we were looking earlier, so what I plotted here is a, um, I took a one degree box around this uh, EPA station, and this you can do using another tool called a Giovanni. And what I plotted is the maximum aerosol optical depth instead of the mean. And you can see the maximum optical depth during this event actually reached up to four or five value. And four aerosol optical depth is considered very, very high optical depth. Typically optical depth in California remains less than 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 4 uh, means it's just super polluted. So I think you can use all these data sets which we discussed today, uh, along with the ground measurement to evaluate and to actually quantify. You can go further, more, few more, a step further and you can quantify how much uh, air quality is degraded um, because of these fires in terms of the number of days, in terms of the number of categories or other metrics uh, you can easily calculate. Thank you everyone for attending today's uh, presentation and now we will move to the question answer. Thanks everyone for uh, attending today's uh, webinar on the fire detections, smoke detections, and aerosols data sets. Uh, so we'll go over the question answer as you have been putting them uh, in the question section one by one, and we'll try to see how much questions uh, we can cover uh, in today's uh, live lesson. Uh, but if there are questions which are remaining and you have put it out, uh, if they are not able, if we are not able to answer today, then we will have uh, written answers to those questions uh, on the ARSA website uh, will be available to you. Okay, uh, Shelvin, are we ready to go? Can you hear me okay? I hear you loud and clear, ready when you are. Thanks. Okay, so on your screen, you should be able to see the questions. Um, Shelvin has been trying to put all these questions in the document, and I will just uh, go one by one, starting from question one. And I can understand some of these questions uh, earlier in the webinar came as we were still going through the presentation. So some of them have been answered. Uh, so I'll try to, depending on the uh, inf available information, I will try to uh, ex expand the answer. So question one, will the global fire atlas be reproduced for 2017 to 21? Can MODIS be used now to create the workflow to make the global fire atlas product? So we have not actually discussed the global fire atlas data in this uh, today's session. 
but uh, uh, I have provided the link to the website here if you like to learn more about that product. And uh, there is also a contact information. Uh, the, if you email to that person, uh, Nails, uh, then you should be able to get more updated information about their future plans for the data product. Okay, so the question two is why are the RGB wavelength for modis and viewers different? So the center wavelength of each band can vary from center to center and it is typically decided by the sensor science team based on the available technology and specific measurement code. Uh, Sometimes uh, these wavelengths uh, can be different as we move and we learn more about the science and the technology. But the, if you need to create the RGB, uh, you can use any, uh, those three channels which are roughly centered around the red, green, and blue part of solar spectrum. So that your RGB is not going to change a whole lot. Uh, the specific feature may change a little bit here and there, but the bigger picture, you should see the similar um, um, value in each of those sensors. How do we distinct the question third, how, we di how do we distinguish clouds from smoke? So I think we did talk about this a little bit. Uh, we just I just want to reemphasize here that we use simultaneous measurement in multiple band or channel. And then we also use spatial variability in cloud and smoke to separate the two features in satellite images. Typically, clouds are uh, flat, what we call in satellite community, uh, in their spectral response, whereas the smoke particles show significant change in the spectral response as you move from one bank to another bank and that is one way in which we can actually separate them but this is not a foolproof method uh, uh, often when you design these algorithm to do this separation automatically uh, there can be cases when we mistakenly sm identify smoke as cloud or vice versa so there are rooms for error in those uh, methods. What is the level of accuracy of these fire data sets from different satellites? How accuracy assessment uh, validation is done? Again, I think we did cover this little bit on around slide 21, and there's a link uh, for a document which provides in much more great detail about the validation efforts. But both uh, MODIS and VIRS have in uh, shown 90% or above 90% accuracies, and often they are validated using higher spatial resolution measurements from other sensors such as Landsat, Sentinel, or uh, Aster, and other uh, sensor which has similar capability to detect the fires. Uh, Sometimes we also do field campaign to uh, do more thorough validation, so that is another way in which uh, these. Uh, sensors or fire data are validated. I think this is question number five is repetitive, same question. Uh, question number six, VS fire detection is so different in area from MODIS. I have to wonder, do we have estimate of false positive rate for VIRS or the false negative of MODIS? Like the MODIS fire data contained a confidence value. Is there anything similar for VIRS for the Fire data too. Yes, both um, MODIS and VIRS data comes with a quality flag, which tells the level of confidence in detecting a particular fires. And it depends on the uh, different test, as we have got shown in the presentation. Uh, there are a number of different tests which uh, has to be applied in order to classify certain pixel as a fires. So the false positive are very limited and often cleaned up during the operational data set production. They are not cleaned up during the near real time product, but during the operational product, they are cleaned up. Um, and false negatives are more difficult to estimate, right? So typically it has been found that uh, because we are higher spatial resolution, it detects three to four times more number of fires than the mode is. And but this can also vary depending on the type of fire, fire size, and which part of the world we are looking at. Um, but those numbers three to four times are global numbers. Question number seven How does one download fire count for data 
of a particular place on a particular device. Again, uh, we have gone through this exercise in the form demo. Please follow the instruction there. Uh, question eight, I'm wondering if both satellite carry the same instrument to detect the temperature anomalies that could explain the large variation along with the spatial resolution for MODIS and VIRS. So MODIS and VIRS are uh, both sensors. So there is a, often uh, we use actually sensors and satellite term interchangeably, but there is a difference. Um, MODIS and VIRS both are sensor. They are not really satellite. Uh, MODIS is about two satellites called Terra, which takes measurement in morning, and another one is Aqua, which takes measurement in the afternoon. And the VIRS is also about two satellites. One is called SUMI NPP, uh, and the second one is NOAA 20. And both sensors use similar bands. Their bands are not exactly the same, but they are very close to each other, and they have very similar algorithms to detect the fire the major difference in the two comes due to the spatial resolution uh, but there are other factors which also play a role which are related to the, their radiometric resolution their spectral resolution and their detection limit question nine the satellite usually have more than one spatial and temporal resolution uh, that is daily 16 day global coverage can we flexibly choose the resolution that we want for fire wildfire monitoring or only specific resolution is detected for wildfire monitoring the spatial resolution for each of the sensor uh, or satellite uh, or individual channel is often fixed uh, so VIRS has two fire detection channel uh, with special resolution of 375 meter and 750 meter resolution whereas MODIS has only one channel with one kilometer spatial resolution. Each satellite makes two measurements per day per 24 hour, one in daytime, one in nighttime on a given location. So although the spatial uh, scales are fixed, uh, the temporal scales can be, uh, can be chosen based on uh, when you're analyzing the data. So you can accumulate the data over different time scales or you can average the data over uh, different time scales. Okay, so the question 10. The satellites usually have more than one spatial and temporal, I think that's the same question. Question number 11. When you are discussing a channel, what do you mean? Okay, so channel or band or spectral band all refer to the center wavelength at which sensor is making measurement. These wavelength corresponds to certain part of electromagnetic solar spectrum. And typically each sensor has uh, N number of different channels. So for example, uh, MODIS has uh, 36 different bands, whereas VIRS has about, I believe 22 bands. So it depends on the different sensor. They, makes measurement in different part of solar spectrum and that is what we call band or channel. What is the percentage in one pixel required to be fire detectable by the satellite? So typically um, a certain pixel is like as I was explaining in the detection algorithm is classified as fire depending on the intensity of the fire. So this intensity is defined by a parameter called fire additive power. It's measured in megawatt, which is measured by satellite. So fire additive power is nothing but rate of emitted radiant energy by the fire at the time of the satellite observation. Uh, in typically we co often call it FRP or fire additive power, and it depends on the amount of fuel and the rate of burning. So higher the FRP of a fire better the chance of detection and satellite does. So typically we don't have information about sub pixel or how within a given pixel, how much area is burning. We, we don't have that information readily available for inactive fire data. Uh, we will discuss some of those aspects when we go to the burnt area calculation uh, that will covered in the next uh, session, next 
couple of sessions, um, uh, session five and six actually. Okay, question 13, how can we differentiate real and fake fire detected by satellite? So it is a difficult problem to solve completely, but there are ways in which we can detect fake fires. For example, if you see a spot on earth, which is classified as fire every single day, then it may be an artificial fire uh, or artificial structure due to the presence of uh, uh, specific uh, man-made structure, for example, solar farm. If you detect a fire uh, every day close to a solar farm or in location where there is a solar farm located, it most likely uh, coming, it's a false alarm, positive false alarm. So by comparing the location of these fires with other type of data sets like land classifications, like uh, locations of the structures which potentially have uh, higher temperature anomalies, uh, for example, areas and deserts. Um, so by, by looking these or intercomparing by these other structure, uh, you can actually identify some of those fake fires. Okay, uh, question number 14. Is fire count really just the number of fire, number of pixels identify as fire, or they aggregate into true events when a single fire may be large and take up many pixels? Is this what post processing models do? So, when we create the data sets, we don't do any pixel merging to, uh, for a larger fire. Fire count are really just the number of pixels identify as fire. But when people do the, use this data in research uh, for emission estimation for burnt area, uh, they may do additional processing or post-processing uh, to uh, to do to account for large fire or small fire in that way. Question fifteen. I think it's the same as uh, fourteen. Question sixteen. Um, I suggest you change the fire count to hotspots count because that is exactly what you're counting. Uh, if fire is collection of hotspots over a continuous area, uh, definition and words matter particularly when the majority of your student have been on a fire in fighting or management role. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion uh, and we will uh, try to look into it. Uh, typically fire counts are used so often in remote sensing community, we often forget it's practical use, but I think that's a great suggestion. Okay, will there be a consolidated list of satellite and links for all sessions available at the end of the session six? Uh, we will have some of these uh, also in addition to that, uh, after each presentation, there are some reference slides uh, where we actually try to summarize some of the satellite sensors and product and resolution so you may want to check out those reference slide as well uh, but we can uh, we we can we can look into uh, see if what what else we can provide which can help uh, users uh, to find the information in one place okay question 18 on slide 21 hotspur were identified under the dense smoke what method can be used to identify hot spot under dense smoke in the image on the slide 21 in California. So we don't have any uh, alternate methods to detect the fires. Um, sorry about that, my kids are. So we, we, like I was saying, we don't have alternate methods to identify hot spots or fire detection uh, under uh, heavy or thin smoke cases. The same algorithms are used, uh, but it is also true that sometimes, depending on the thickness of the smoke layer, uh, uh, some of the fires can be missed. But if these fires are large enough, and if they are producing enough uh, FRP or in, uh, have enough intensity, 
which can penetrate through those smoke uh, plumes then the fire will be detected question number 19 um, so we said that weirs detected three to four times more fire than modis does this difference in detection refer to pixel count total burnt area or both this is uh, referred to the pixel count question number 20 i'm interested in identifying fire smoke from low level fog the interest is in where there is overlap it can produce dangerous transportation issues okay uh, i'm not sure what is the question here uh, but i can understand the problem um, and uh, i think there there can be ways and it can be done but we haven't covered that part here in this uh, if you're interested more please uh, send me an email and i will be able to probably direct you to some research published research on the topic Okay, thanks for sharing the wonderful tool worldview. Is there any possibility to quantify the release of gases like CO2, NO2 during wildfires? Uh, yes, uh, there are ways in which you can do actually calculate the emissions of individual gases. We will learn about some of the emission inventories, how they are developed in next session um, on Thursday. Um, uh, but and then that's where we will actually learn some more about how we can get uh, both uh, particulate emissions as well as the trace gases. Question 22, can worldview data be freely downloaded? Uh, also, I want to know if it's possible to download data of a particular area or city of the world. So yes, all the data which are available on various NASA centers, the, either it's Worldview firms or any other, they are all free. Um, you can download the data for particular area or city, uh, either from firms uh, or from, uh, there are not too many options on Worldview for downloading the data, but there are other resources. And we have some training material uh, on our set website uh, for specific uh, data download instruction and you can follow along those uh, to get the data for a particular location. Okay. Is it possible to save California's 2020 wildfire as JPG image to be used in publication and how do I cite it? So if you are referring to the world view uh, site, yes, you can save the image as JPEG or PNG. If you go on top right corner, there are options. There's a camera sign. If you use that sign, there are options to download the image. Uh, you can select certain area and you can download the image as JPEG, PNG or KMZ or other format. Um, and if you go to the information page or about page, you will find a uh, a instruction on how to um, cite the world view in the publication. Question 24. If we use satellite imagery in the case of forest truck fires, how do we know if the fire is accidental or purpose, such as land clearing? From satellite point of view, it is not possible to determine the cause of fire uh using satellite data alone uh, uh you you will have to have a information from the ground to identify the cause of fire question 25 can we trace the propagation of wildfire using high resolution fire detection from viewers you can you could view the day-to-day -day progression of the parameter of larger fire if if not needed in uh, near real-time data you can look at the progression in burnt area product also and if you are looking to uh, monitor the progress of wildfire within a given day only then you will have to rely on geostationary satellite which can actually provide you every 10 15 minute measurement and that will allow you to not only monitor the progression of fires as well as the transport of smoke in different parts
question 26 for me the hardest part of using world view is the projection of the map it is hard to look at the area at higher lower latitude even with the arctic projection are there any plans to add more projection option to this tool uh not sure about the projection features which will be added to the world view but this is a great suggestion and i would strongly recommend that you use one of those contact information given on the world view and uh, make your suggestion directly to the world view team is there a way to correlate fire resins to fire detected um i'm not very clear on that question so i will leave it at that point question 28 how did you differentiate between forest fire and agriculture fires so agriculture fires uh, sets by human uh, for the purpose of crop residue cleaning forest fires that takes place in forest ecosystem as opposed to crop field can have both natural and human cause Typically, agriculture fires tend to be smaller and less hot than the forest fires, making them more difficult to detect from the satellite. But in addition, we use the land cover type data sets, uh, which we can superimpose with the fire data to differentiate between different types of fire. And we can also use sometimes higher spatial resolution data, uh, such as Landsat, uh, to detect these small fires. What is the need of using MODIS data which has a coarser resolution as compared to VS data that has a better resolution? So as you know, MODIS has been around for almost 20 years and that is the advantage of MODIS. VS came along in 2012. So if you're really looking for long-term stable time series of the data, uh, then MODIS provide that. Uh, VS is getting there and VS eventually will replace MODIS uh, but in absence of years, uh, MODIS is the census to look for the longer time series. Okay, question number 30. How can we differentiate fire on the basis of higher degree of probability on the basis of satellite data? Okay, again, I'm not clear about this question, so I will leave it. Uh, question 31. Gridded fire hotspot is showing actual count of fire pixel correct and not group of pixels that makes up the fire yes the actual number of fires within a grid cells defined by a box of latitude and longitude um, that is the uh, actual fire count question 32 how does forms determine that const what constitute one fire in other words what is the sensitivity threshold for one fire detected again uh, forms and worldview and all other NASA sources use the same fire data detected by the fire algorithm as we discussed in first part of this talk um, and uh, we have already discussed some of the limitations of this fire detections. Okay, question number 33. Is it possible to give real world feedback to the database to exclude industrial exhaust and given and give input from real wildfire event that were not detected is it possible to give real world feedback to the database to exclude industrial exhaust so i'm not sure what is the uh, if this if you are referring for the data processing center, then we don't have any mechanism to receive this kind of feedback right now. But if you are referring to the post processing by individual researchers or application users, uh, then definitely they can use additional database uh, of industrial exhaust or others to, uh, to mask those uh, specific fires to uh, come up with the wildfires events or whatever type of fires they are specifically interested in
question number 34 can the sensors detect hot spot in plume of fire and mark a hot point that isn't this on the surface that is very good question uh, honestly i don't know the correct answer uh, my my understanding is that it should not be detecting uh, fire uh, in the hot smoke plume uh, but i might i may be wrong i might I, I i can be wrong so honestly i really don't know the correct answer okay question 35 what is the ideal threshold of confidence for fire detection also are there range regarding frp to classify strong and weak fires uh, yes there are range of frps which can classify the weak fire or strong fires and some of that is being used while defining the confidence level of fire detection uh, i don't remember top of my head what is those thresholds uh, in frp uh, but if you look again uh, the slide, I think 2021, where we have given some reference uh, to the ATVT or the algorithm document, uh, you will be able to find some more specifics on that topic. Okay, what does the smoke from peat fires look like? How does it differ from the wildfire smoke? Okay, um, I'm not... Uh, so peat fires are typically uh, smoldering type of fires. Um, they burn for a long time, continuous smoke is emitting. On the other hand, wildfires are uh, uh, typically burn very fast, quickly progressing and produce huge plumes of smokes. Uh, I think that is my understanding. Melanie, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think that's a good distinction. Um, I'm not sure visually from true color imagery that you could distinguish, say, a peat fire from a forest fire, just using, just like looking at the color, for example. More information would be needed. Okay. Thanks, Melanie. Okay, question 37. How about utilizing angstrom exponent and single scattering LV to differentiate dust and smoke? Uh, yes, uh, we can use uh, actually both of these parameters. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have very good estimates of single scattering LVDO from the satellite, except we get some data from OMI. Uh, Angstrom coefficient is uh, in principle same thing as we use the combination of multiple uh, spectral channel because Angstrom coefficient is nothing but the uh, spectral uh, different in spectral response to the different types of aerosols. So uh, people often use Angstrom exponents uh, to actually detect dust uh, more. Um, for smoke, it is a little bit tricky because uh, if you use specific thresholds, uh, some urban aerosols, urban type particles, which are of the similar size range can also be detected as a smoke. Okay, so we are nearing uh, to close our session in another three minutes. I'll try to take a few more questions. In the MODIS Actify datasets in which the confidence values vary from zero to 100, are there generally accepted threshold used to help distinguish between false alarm and real fires? Alternately, what thresholds are applied to numerical confidence value to classify low nominal and high confidence of fire detection in the MODIS datasets? Uh, I'm not actually sure about what uh, specific numbers are assigned, uh, but the low nominal and high confidence uh, numbers does not really depend only on those values, but it has other parameters which play into a role, which are related to the specific test which algorithm go through. Uh, but I'm not sure about specific numbers which goes into these levels of confidence.
okay question number 39 can we do prediction studies of air quality or forest fire using nasa world view okay um i think the short answer is no uh, we will learn about some of the uh, prediction or forecasting in next session on thursday uh, uh, but depending on specific uh, needs uh, there may be some studies which can be done but uh, not in general will we see an example application to make the fire product as a summary uh, again i'm not sure if i understand the question here uh, but we did look a case study in this presentation and we will look throughout this webinar series some of the case studies if that is what you mean okay so the last question i'm going to take uh, after that we will close the session could we calculate concentration of aerosols uh, from satellite to compare with the concentration from the ground monitor station chemistry yes so we will do uh, the some of this calculation uh, especially the emissions uh, in session four on thursday uh, if you are referring to the mass concentration when you are comparing with the ground station that's something like pm 2.5 or no 2 then that has been done differently and we looked some of that uh, in today's presentation uh, for pm 2.5 uh, but we do have some specific webinar also and how to convert those aerosol which comes from satellite that is aerosol optical depth to PM 2.5. So we do have some specific training material on that on our set website. Okay, uh, I think uh, since it's already 1.15 and 12.15 for me, um, maybe we can close this question answer session now. I know there are several more questions left. Actually, there are not too many. Should I just take them quickly? Only five more left. Okay, uh, quickly, what did you design the tropomy loop with? So I used the NOAA's JSTAR mapper, which uh, 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 which has tropomy data available. Can you give a brief on how the thermal anomaly thresholds values are determined? Uh, are these the same world view? Okay, I'm not very clear about this question. 43, I will skip it. Could you please elaborate on false positive? Okay, so the false positives are basically uh, uh, the the fires where um, where algorithm or satellite is detecting as a fire, but in fact, in reality, it is not a fire. It can be it can be a structure or solo form or some something happening on the ground which uh, making the area hot enough to be detected as a fire. Do you think that it is possible to use different wavelength to detect the type of dust event, limestone, red sands? Yeah. So there have been some research studies to do that, uh, but uh, we don't have any uh, data product uh, to do that. But uh, people have done on a research basis, and if you look the literature, you may find some reference. Okay, question forty-six: How much modeling accuracy can be attributed to PM two point five data if we use as our basis for predicting modeling for regional AQ. Again, uh, this is more related to modeling of air quality. So I will defer to the next session and we will cover some of that aspect in next session. Question 47, how can we forecast the movement of fire? I'm assuming that the variable to take into account are those used in pre-fire assessment but how do we keep track of their special temporal trends in relations to the presence of active fire? So it is hard problem to uh, detect the movement of fire itself on the ground. And again, uh, I'm assuming we are talking about the actual fire, not the smoke. Uh, so it really depends on many factors which we discussed uh, during the pre-fire assessment, like fuel type, the soil moisture, temperatures, wind directions, uh, available fuels, um, all those factors play a role. 
uh, there are models which probably uh, applied uh, locally by different agencies, um, but I'm not familiar with uh, those models myself. Okay, I think that's all. We took all the questions. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and uh, hopefully you have something to learn from this webinar series and we will uh, get back again on Thursday with uh, another session on air quality forecasting and fire emission database. Thanks everyone.